Okay, so in this video we're going to talk about angular momentum, and we're going to start by taking a look at alpha in two of its uh, forms that we know. So angular acceleration alpha can either be uh, the net torque divided by the moment of inertia, or it can be the change in angular velocity over the change in time. We're going to set these two equations equal to each other. So net tau over i equals delta omega over delta t. Then I'm going to multiply both sides by i and by delta t so that I get sigma tau times delta t equals i times delta omega. This is what's known as angular impulse. And it is analogous to linear impulse, where net force applied for an amount of time is equal to m delta v. Now, remember when we talk about linear impulses, that m delta v really is a change in mv minus mv naught. Just like this would be a change in i omega minus i omega naught. Well, in the same way that we call linear momentum, which I'm going to write this up here, p equals mv, in the same way that we call linear momentum p, we give it its own variable, and it is linear inertia times linear velocity. Well, these are rotational inertias times rotational velocities, so we call them rotational or angular momentums. The letter that we use for angular momentum is L. Okay, so that is the big takeaway here for you. The angular momentum is I omega. So we can really write L minus L naught or delta L to finish off this equation. Now, the units for angular momentum, well, they're a little weird. They come out to be kilograms meters squared per second, which is a bit of a, an odd unit. All right, now, because angular momentum is, you know, essentially just the rotational version of linear momentum, um, and all of the same rules apply, Newton's third law, you know, applies. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Well, a torque is an action of force, and so for every torque that's caused by something, there's an equal and opposite torque. That leads to the conservation of angular momentum, which for us is as easy as just writing L O L. That's right. You can lol for conservation of angular momentum. And most problems won't do this, but it's help for us, helpful for us to kind of write it. Sometimes the shape of the object changes. And if that's the case, then your I actually has an initial form, I naught, and a final form, I. Otherwise, you could just call it I. But know that that sometimes happens when you're working with the conservation of angular momentum. Okay, so let's do an example. This is a classic problem called the carousel problem. Now, if you don't know what a carousel is, oh, there's angular momentum, uh, it's just this weird thing, right? You can have a fancy carousel with horses and stuff like that, but you're probably more familiar with this rotating platform that you used to use to see which of your friends was the weakest. So a carousel is just a platform that rotates. Sometimes it could be a turntable, like, you know, for a record player or something like that. Um, the AP test loves these things. And the carousel is usually not called a carousel, it's just called a rotating platform. So here we have, you drop a ball of mass M that sticks to the edge of a rotating platform of mass capital M, sometimes the AP test says that, that has an angular velocity of omega naught. We're going to find omega. If you want, pause the video and see if you can use LOL to solve for the angular velocity. Okay. So the first thing that I would do is I would consider the angular momentum that's in the beginning. Because you're dropping the ball, you won't have any angular momentum for the ball in the beginning. But the disc or the platform is rotating, so you would say that you have some angular momentum for the rotating disc in the beginning. Now, to help us keep track of things, I'm going to go ahead and call the rotating disc, I'm going to call this guy thing one, and the dropped ball thing two. It's going to help us keep track of things. Um, you'll notice that when we write equations, we'll fill it with either a lowercase m or a capital M. So you only have inertia, or I'm sorry, rotational inertia, or the moment of inertia, for the first object, the rotating platform. So I'm going to write that like this. I1, omega 1, naught. Okay, so that's the angular momentum for the rotating platform in the beginning. Now because it calls the initial angular velocity of the rotating platform in omega naught, I'm just going to go ahead and actually call that omega naught. 
after the collision, right, um, when you drop the ball, then they both stick together. Now that's an important thing for us to consider. Let's let's write out the after conversion for a second. I1 omega 1 plus I2 omega 2. All right, so basically what it means when they stick together is that they have the same angular velocity. So we don't need to call this omega 1 or omega 2, we can just call it omega. And then hopefully you see that this is as easy as adding the two moments of inertia together. Um, this would be considered a perfectly inelastic angular collision if you had to use a very long phrase to describe it. But for our purposes, it's pretty straightforward. Okay, so now if I'm going to need to find omega naught, I'm probably going to need to find omega in terms, that's how the AP does it, of m and capital M, or maybe they use m1 and m2. It, they sort of alternate from question to question. Um, so I'm going to want to replace all of the i's with their appropriate m's. So let's talk about what each i is going to be equal to, i1 and i2. All right, now I1 is something that would be told to you on the AP test. They would tell you that it's a disk or some weird shape. Um, and in this case, it is a disk. So we're going to use I capital M R squared. So I got to be careful to make sure that I indicate that it's a capital M since that's what they're using. Now the ball, this is something that you guys are going to struggle to remember. But if you can remember it, it's super, super helpful. Whenever you have this kind of a problem, and it's a ball that's, you know, being dropped on a platform, or maybe it's a kid that's running towards the platform and jumping on it, or maybe it's an arrow that gets shot into a rod. Do any of these sound familiar? You can really just treat them as a point or a particle that is about to be rotating at the radius, in this case R, that they are telling you where it's going to be. So if it's a point, a particle, or just like a ball, you can just go ahead and say that it's inertia, it's moment of inertia, is m r squared. And they have to be careful. Like if for some reason um, this ball was dropped halfway, like in the middle of the platform, then I would write m r over 2 squared. Hint. But for this problem, it's on the edge, so I use r for my radius. But notice that I made a lowercase and a capital case m here, so that I can start to see the differences. Okay, so let's plug this in. I'm going to have... Actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to arrange for omega first and then plug in the i's. I've got i1 omega naught over i1 plus i2. Okay, so if I want to fill this out, I would say 1 half m r squared times omega naught over um, 1 half, oh, so hard with the capitals, capital M r squared plus m r squared. All right, now likely, likely you are not going to want to simplify this. There are some simplifications that you could do. Um, probably the most obvious is to just put the 2 down here, but really the only simplic simplification that you would have to do for the AP test, if this was asked of you, is you would have to be able to get rid of r squared because you see that there's an r squared in every term. So r squared disappears and we are left with this equation. That is totally appropriate. You could do more if you want to, but you don't have to. All right, here's a variant of the carousel problem where the rotating platform initially is not rotating, it's at rest, but something is thrown at it and it starts to move. Maybe it's a kid that jumps on the edge of the carousel, I don't know. Whatever it is, that object has an initial velocity that we're going to call v naught, And more than likely, what you're going to want to know is the angular velocity at the end. Now let's say, you know, just for fun, let's say that you actually weren't asked to find the angular velocity, but instead you were asked to find the linear velocity. So like you're a kid, you jump onto a carousel and you start moving. And I don't want to know your angular velocity. I want to know how fast are you going in a circle? How much circumference per second are you covering? What's your final V? Let's talk about how to do this, because that is something that is asked to be on the AP test, and it's a little bit confusing. Let's start by laughing out loud, because, oh my god, how are we going to solve this? And then, let's consider what has angular momentum in the beginning, and what doesn't. In the beginning, the thing that has angular momentum, this is kind of weird, is whatever is jumping onto the carousel. Now, even though it's probably not going in a circle at that moment, you would still treat it like it's going in a circle. Okay, so here's what I mean. Let's call, again, 
the ball or the kid or whatever thing two and we'll call the disc thing one and we have the same moments of inertia right thing one is one half capital m r squared thing two is just lowercase m r squared all right so in this problem what i'm saying is that you do have angular momentum for thing two so you would write i2 omega 2 naught all right now stick with me here at the end you're going to have angular momentum for both objects but since it's another situation where they stick right the idea is that the kid jumps onto the edge and they're probably going to stay there if we don't have to call this omega 1 and omega 2 we can call it omega and lump the moments of inertia together okay so let's talk about what we need to do here i'll write this about what we need to do to effectively find the linear velocity here's the key the linear velocity is inside of the final angular velocity right the linear velocity at the edge specifically is related to the angular velocity by v over capital r if i wanted the linear velocity in the middle of the disk then i would say v over r over 2 which would become 2v over r all right so i want to find the angular velocity at the end so that i can get the linear velocity out of it now the same is true about the initial angular velocity v2 naught this can be considered an angular velocity omega 2 god that's terrible omega 2 naught because it would be v naught divided by the radius r take a second pause the video make sure you understand this concept it's weird the ball the kid the whatever it's not currently going in a circle but it's about to be going in a circle and so at that moment right before the collision it has an angular momentum and that angular momentum depends on its linear velocity and whatever distance from the center of the rotation that's about to happen that's sort of a weird thing so now we can plug that in and we've got i2 actually you know what let's just let's just go ahead here and plug in i2 m r squared there we go we got i2 times instead of omega 2 naught we're going to do v naught over r v naught over r immediately you should see a cancellation okay here we've got one half capital m r squared plus lowercase m r squared and our angular velocity which i'm going to go ahead and write as v times r now i hope you see this make sure that you can see this we can get rid of all of the r's we can get rid of this r right because it's on the outside so it's in every term and then what do you see is also in every term this r squared Ooh, so it's just like when we do net torque problems for atwood's machines and things like that we don't need the radius it's beautiful we love it and you get one half capital m plus lowercase m times v so if i wanted to find the final velocity in a linear velocity not the angular velocity then it would be v equals m v naught over one half capital m plus lowercase m now of course if you knew the ratio of the masses um like maybe capital m is four times bigger than lowercase m then you would replace that with four m and m and you would get an actual you know number um, but it's more than likely that the AP test is going to say one thing is capital M the other thing is lowercase m or the other thing that they might do is m1 and m2 which I'm sure that you're seeing all right I hope that these examples have helped you see how to use the conservation of angular momentum especially in this very convoluted way that the AP test wants you to use it a lot of the times this is sort of like um, you know the grand poobah of problems that they want you to solve where there's a lot of variables and there's a lot of thinking and it's really not that complicated um, but it can get kind of confusing remember you are great at physics and I'm so proud of you for getting through this awful video you did it good job